Hello, this is the sixth video in the section on calculus. And in this video, I'm going to be introducing integration and going over some of the basic concepts of integration. So as I said, when I first introduced the, this section, there are two basic operations in calculus, differentiation and integration. And uh, we've already discussed differentiation, including partial derivatives. And now we're going to discuss the second operation, integration, and the relationship between the two. And so uh, I believe most of you have seen integration a bit before. I'm going to go over the basic definitions. The, first of all, we have what's called a definite integral of a function. And a definite integral represents the area between the x-axis and the graph of a function. And so we have here a definite integral of a function f between two points, a and b. And that represents the yellow area shown here, which is the area in between a and b on the x-axis, the x-axis, and then the graph of the function above, the yellow area. And I uh, <clears throat> want to remind you as well, this is the signed area. So in this slide, I show you a graph which is entirely above the x-axis in between a and b. If the graph goes below the x-axis, as is shown here, then the area below the x-axis is counted as negative, and this definite integral would be the sum of the area uh, above the x-axis in between the below the graph and the area below the x-axis above the graph subtracted. Okay, uh, and I just want to also mention a bit of terminology related to this. When we integrate a function f, we call that function f the integrand, and this is a term that I will use. f is the integrand in this definite integral. Okay, so the focus of integral calculus is to find this area, and we can define this area uh, by subdividing the interval between a and b up into smaller subintervals, and then estimating the area in between the x-axis and underneath the curve by taking these rectangles. And later, we're actually going to talk about different ways of estimating this area by dividing this region up into different types of shapes. But uh, the most basic one is to simply use rectangles to estimate this area under the graph, and then you uh, shrink the width of each of the rectangles or divide the interval from A to B up into smaller subintervals in order to get more refined estimates. So if we just use two subintervals, we divide up into these two rectangles. The width of each one is delta x, and the area of the yellow region shown would be given by this sum. And then if we want to refine this, we um, divide up into more subintervals. So for example, here we divide it up into four subintervals. And we get this yellow area shown, which you know, we see is closer now to the area above the x-axis and below the graph. And we can uh, decrease delta x or increase the number of subintervals we use, and we get more accurate approximations. So here is shown the number, the region we would have if we used eight subintervals, and then 16. And as delta x goes to zero, we, we just take more and more subintervals, smaller and smaller delta x, which is the width of each of the subintervals. And in the limit, as delta x goes to zero, we get exactly this uh, yellow area above the x-axis and below the curve, y equals f of x, the graph of f. And now the basic insight of calculus is that uh, this idea of a definite integral area uh, between the x-axis and the curve is related to the idea of differentiation, which is a surprising insight. And this is why calculus is important. This is what was discovered by Newton and Leibniz when they discovered calculus. And the basic insight is this. If we have a function capital F, whose derivative is lowercase f, the integrand, then this definite integral of lowercase f, which from a to b, is this capital F evaluated at the two endpoints subtracted. So f at b minus f at a. <clears throat> and so this fact is one part of what we call the fundamental theorem of calculus, really the important fact of it that comes from calculus, the relationship between de definite integration and uh, differentiation. So this is uh, what I had in the previous slide. If the derivative of capital F is lowercase f, then the definite integral of lowercase f from a to b is capital F at b minus capital F at a. This is the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. 
And it shows that uh, if we want to find indefinite integrals, I'm sorry, definite integrals of, of f, then what we want to find is, is uh, antiderivatives, so uh, functions whose derivative is lowercase f. Uh, the other part of the fundamental theorem of calculus is sort of complementary to this first part. Uh, and it says that if you define a function which is given by this definite integral, so here we think of a, the lower limit in this integration, as being fixed, and b as being the variable, and then we take the function which is given the uh, area between the x-axis and the graph of f in between a and b as we vary b. If you take the derivative of this function with respect to b, so h prime of b, you get f of b. And this is uh, complementary to the first part. Uh, and so I want to go over a sort of sketch of how you would prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's not really a rigorous proof, but it can give you an idea of why it's true. I think it's quite a surprising thing at first if you haven't thought about it. And so I want to explain heuristically why the fundamental theorem of calculus is true. And so it's, the best way to do it, I think, is to uh, consider first why the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus is true. So let's suppose we have this function f from a and b, and we, we take its definite integral from a to b, and we define that to be of the function h of b. And we're going to think uh, h depends on b, so we think of varying this limit b, and then we have area between the x-axis and the graph for different values of b. So we, we want to take the derivative of the function h, and remember the derivative is given by is a, a certain limit of uh, slopes of secant lines, and so we need to know what is h at b plus uh, delta b. And so if we add a, a small delta b to b, then we get uh, the h at b plus delta b is the area between the x-axis and the graph between a and b plus delta b. And then we want to know what is the change in h that results from uh, this change in b, delta b. So we say what is h of b plus delta b minus h of b. And that's just the area in between b and b plus delta b, which is shown here. Uh, the width at the bottom of this little yellow region is delta b. And so this yellow region is representing the definite integral here from b to b plus delta b. And now if you think about this, as delta b gets smaller, this yellow region is going to become very, very much like a rectangle, where the height of the rectangle is the value of the function f at b, and the width at the bottom is delta b. So as delta b gets smaller, it gets close to a rectangle, and so it gets close to this value f of b, the height of that rectangle. It's not exactly the rectangle, but approximately this rectangle times delta b. All right, and so this basic uh, approximation here is, is kind of the, the reason why the fundamental theorem of calculus is true, or at least the second part, because now you can, well, we want to take the derivative of h at the point b, and take the limit as delta b goes to zero, and the change in h divided by the change in b. And it, I've just explained on the previous slide why the uh, change in h is approximately uh, f of b times delta b. And then these delta b's will cancel out. And we'll get uh, that this is equal to f of b. <clears throat> and so it, this was then the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The derivative of this h is equal to the integrand evaluated at b. OK, so that's the justification of the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, the first part. Uh, follows from the second part, and one additional fact, which is that if you have two functions whose derivatives are the same, then they have to differ by a constant. And so if you have uh, two functions, f and h, with the same derivative for all points, then f equals h plus a constant. Okay. Uh, so... The, I'll give a brief explanation of why this first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus follows from uh, the second part and this fact. So uh, set it up, suppose capital F has derivative lowercase f, the integrand, and h is defined as in the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, be this definite integral. Then 
from the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, the derivative of h is f at b, and also the derivative of f, capital F is lowercase f, and so h and capital F have the same derivatives. So f has to equal h plus a constant. And finally, if you look at uh, h here, if you put in b equals a, then you have the definite integral from a to a, and that's just zero because the area between uh, a and a is just a zero. And so you have h at a equals zero, and so you get f at a equals c. And so therefore, uh, this definite integral is f of b minus f of a. And that's the, set of the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that to evaluate a definite integral, what we need to do is find the antiderivative, or a antiderivative, for the integrand f. So find the capital F whose derivative is lowercase f. And motivated by this, we introduce the concept of an indefinite integral, which is the opposite of differentiation. And so an indefinite integral is the set of all possible antiderivatives for lowercase f. And so if you recognize a function lowercase f as the derivative of capital F, then the indefinite integral of lowercase f is capital F uh, plus a constant to represent the fact that when you differentiate a constant, it could be zero. So the capital F um, is the set of all possible antiderivatives, and so you can add a constant, and that doesn't change the fact that uh, capital F is an antiderivative. And so uh, if lowercase f equals the derivative of capital F, then uh, capital F is the indefinite integral of lowercase f, and really we should add constant in there as well. So this capital F is uh, possible the set, the set of all possible functions whose derivative is lowercase f. So it's, you find one of those functions and then you add a constant. So as a simple example, first example of finding an indefinite integral, maybe we want to find the indefinite integral of cosine. And cosine is the derivative of sine. So the capital F here is sine, the lowercase f is cosine. And we write it this way. In, in these indefinite integrals, we write this dx to indicate that the variable is x. Sometimes there might be constants or other things in the equation, and we indicate that we're taking the antiderivative or indefinite integral with respect to the variable x. And we add this constant as well, because when you take the derivative of the constant, you get 0. So sine of x plus any constant gives you cosine of x. The indefinite integral is the set of all possible antiderivatives for cosine x. Another example, a very simple example, is the integral of e to the x. And we know e to the x is the derivative of e to the x, the function that has that property. And so the indefinite integral is uh, e to the x, and then plus a constant. And so just to review, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, f, f is the indefinite integral for lowercase f, capital F is the indefinite integral for lowercase f, then the definite integral of lowercase f between two points a and b is capital F at b minus capital F at a. And so the fundamental theorem of calculus is what allows us to do this, to calculate definite integrals by finding indefinite integral and then evaluating at two endpoints. Uh, a bit of uh, terminology, when uh, it's, it's easier to simply to say integral sometimes when we mean indefinite integral, and I will use that terminology. So if it, hopefully it won't be confusing whether I mean a definite or indefinite integral. Sometimes I'll just say the word integral for uh, an indefinite integral. Okay, so in basic calculus classes, which you've probably taken before, uh, you mostly learn many different methods to calculate indefinite integrals. And then you sometimes use those uh, indefinite integrals to evaluate definite integrals. And we're going to do this in the next lecture. We're going to go over methods of calculating indefinite integrals. And so these are these computational methods of finding uh, antiderivatives for given functions. And there's uh, three different methods we'll look at, integration by parts, integration by substitution, and partial fraction. And we'll start that in the next lecture.